In this video, I want to do a very basic introduction to virtual instruments. So this is for somebody who's new to music production. With music software, you have this thing called virtual instruments or plugins, and these are made by other companies that run inside the program of your choice. So let's get you up to speed so you can find which virtual instruments are going to benefit you the most in your own production needs. So virtual instruments came around the early 2000s, and Steinberg, the company that makes Cubase, was one of the first companies to make a protocol called VST or Virtual Studio Technologies. And they made this protocol or this software available to everyone. So you could license it and then you could actually make your own VST instruments that would run inside any program that could host VST instruments. But the Steinberg Neon, if you just look that one up on YouTube, do yourself a favor and look that up because there's a couple of videos showing what it sounded like. And I actually got into music production right at the time when this came out. And so I do remember that, and it was a long time ago, and it sounded horrible, but I remember being at a Tom Lee Music in Canada and being very excited about the potential of virtual instruments. Because what you have to understand is with virtual instruments, you've got the synthesizer sounds in your computer, but up until that point, you had to have hardware synthesizers like the ones I've got in my studio here, hooked up to your computer. And people would have dozens of these synthesizers sometimes hooked up to one computer and have the computer control all of those instruments in real time. So it's extremely complex and a ton of routing in studios and it costs a ton of money. So synthesizers have never been cheap and they still aren't cheap, hardware synthesizers. And there's still a reason for hardware synthesizers, but most people nowadays are using virtual instruments. So the Neon was one of the first ones and very quickly companies like Native Instruments started producing virtual instruments as well. And they started to get really good. And then a program called Reason came along and Reason was kind of like a whole bunch of virtual instruments in one program and that's all it did. So it would just make instrument sound. You couldn't even record audio in, into it at first. But Reason eventually got those capabilities and now is a full-fledged DAW or digital audio workstation. So virtual instruments just kept getting more and more powerful. Computers kept getting more and more powerful. And now we're at the point where you can have these monster orchestral virtual instruments being controlled by your keyboards and create the sound of you know, a beautiful orchestra and have it be realistic enough to be in movie soundtracks and things like that. So I think the most important thing to understand when you're first learning this is that there really are two different ways to make sounds with a virtual instrument. One is to have a synthesizer-based instrument where the computer is imitating something called an oscillator or other ways of generating sounds that used to be done on hardware synthesizers. So to begin with, what you need to understand is there's really two different ways to create sounds with a virtual instrument. The first is synthesized, so it's the computer trying to imitate the sound of maybe an analog synthesizer and the way it used to create sounds from the 60s and onwards or it could be a sampled instrument where you have little tiny recordings of sound that have been made in a studio or maybe not in a studio and then mapped out onto a keyboard virtually so that when you play a C, it actually triggers the sound of a C maybe recorded on a real piano or maybe the C from a violin or the C from a synthesizer, a classic synthesizer. So you get the sound of a classic synthesizer, but you're not actually trying to recreate the sound. You're just recording the sound and triggering it back. So that's called sampled instruments. And then you have virtual instruments that are a hybrid of the two. So you'll have a synthesized sound and maybe a sampled sound at the same time, somehow influencing each other. And there's lots of virtual instruments that do this hybrid as well. So loads of different ways to imitate virtually hardware synthesizers. So you would have something like an oscillator that creates a tone. Here I've got this Model 77, which is a brand new one from Softube. And this virtual instrument here is imitating the sound of a Yamaha CS80. So if we look at what a CS80 actually looks like, it had oscillators which create a tone. It's basically like creating electricity that causes a speaker to move. So it'd have an oscillator that would create a tone and you could take that oscillation and you could make it go faster, which would make the pitch go higher, or you can make it slower, which would make the pitch go lower. So there's all these different ways of creating tones with hardware synthesizers that started probably in the 60s, maybe even back to the 50s. I have a video on synthesis basics. So we won't go over synthesis basics in this video. Make sure you go watch that one if you wanna learn how synthesizers worked and how they started. You know, I've got, I actually, I actually use my Roland Juno 6 here 
and compare that with the software on the computer as well, so with virtual instruments. So there are tons and tons of recreations out there. The Model 77 is just a brand new one. And so if we go and start playing with some of these virtual knobs and sliders, we're gonna change the character of the sound. Let's go with this little patch right here and just play something in. So I just recorded a bunch of notes and of course with MIDI I can go change all of those notes and change the key. I can quantize them so that they're all perfectly in time. Once I've recorded information into a virtual instrument, I can then of course go and change the characteristics of the sound. So again, I can go back to that filter. Right in here I'm kind of changing that slider over time. We could do other things with a virtual instrument like control the attack of the filter. This is the filter that's kind of filtering out these high frequencies. If we play with this little attack slider here, instead of me moving a slider around over time, and not only that, if you're like, no, you know what? I just want to control it manually. I just want to grab this filter and have it slide up and down over time or, or control it whenever I want it to. With all of your programs now, you have something called automation. So I can just turn on automation for this instrument. I can press play. And record that as automation. Now watch what happens when I press play. It's pretty cool stuff. And this has been around for, you know, like I say, almost 20 years. Okay, so that is a virtual synthesizer creating tones virtually, you know, with a software emulation of what hardware actually used to do as an oscillator creating a tone. Synthesizers go way beyond just these simple oscillators and get really complex. And there's all these different forms of synthesis. Some of them are hardware based like FM synthesis on the Yamaha DX7. I've got one of those in the studio as well. And then there's other types of synthesis like wavetable synthesis, where you have this complex starting point and you can have it morph into other complex waves in real time. So that's called wavetable synthesis. Actually, I just saw an amazing video made by Starsky Carr on wavetable synthesis. So I'm gonna put that one in the description. So all of these different ways to generate sounds and all of these companies that are creating virtual equivalents. So this is Arturia's OPXAV. We get to go and create patches with it without actually owning the hardware. And it's quite amazing how close they get to the sound of these original synthesizers. But thing you have to remember is there's other synthesizers out there as well that aren't just trying to do something that was already done. Right? So you have recreations, but then you have new synthesis methods. Sampled instruments have been around for a really long time. And if you've watched Ferris Bueller's Day Off, then you've seen a sampler in action. In that movie, he had an emulator too, I think it was. And so we have a virtual version of that as well. And that worked by taking little recordings and triggering them back via the hardware. And it probably cost around $8,000 back in the 80s, so you can imagine how much that would have cost. So you can hear all it's doing as you move up the keyboard is just making it faster, pitching it up. So you start to lose realism as you go up or down the keyboard. In my little video review of this, I actually loaded in the sneeze. Uh, just like he did in the movie. So if you want to hear that, I'll show you how to do that. It's quite easy. And the other problem with sample-based instruments early on was just the amount of storage space that you could have on an early keyboard, something in the 80s or the 90s even. So you're talking kilobytes or maybe even megabytes of sampled sounds, little recordings that could have been mapped out on the keyboard. So you were totally limited in the amount of stuff that you could actually do with a sample-based instrument. So once things hit the computer in the early 2000s and virtual samplers came along, our ceiling of how much we could actually trigger or how much we could have as a sample library just went up exponentially. So we went from having you know, megabytes on these cards that you would load into a keyboard to having gigabytes. 
Dempel Library is like this trillion acoustic bass, upright bass from Spectrosonics. It's been around for a long time, like maybe 10 or 15 years. And Trillion, made back then, has over 20,000 samples recorded for this one upright bass. So you can have little slides, you can have all these pops and slaps and stuff like that to make it sound more realistic. So that's why they've got so many different little recordings. Can you imagine being the upright bass player in that session who had to record over 20, well, probably way more than 20,000 sounds for this virtual instrument to exist? And the thing they did early on to make samples sound more realistic, if you play one note over and over again, and it's one sample, one recording, it's gonna be really obvious to anyone's ear that this is not a real instrument. So they have something called round robin. If you play one note over and over, you are gonna hear multiple recordings of that exact same note over and over again. That's called round robin. So the more round robin samples you have, the bigger your instrument is, but the more realistic it sounds. The other thing they would do is velocity layering. So if you play soft and hard, you get a totally different sample, a different recording. So you can imagine all of these different layers that you could have. And some of them have you know, over a dozen different layers as you go from soft to loud. And then they have multiple round robin at whatever loudness you're playing at. So we're talking about a crazy amount of information to make something sound realistic. That's just what they needed to start convincing us that we weren't hearing fake instruments. So that's round robin and velocity layering with sampled instruments. And then the next way they made these sound a lot more realistic was to add something called key switches. And key switches are a way of using lower keys on your keyboard to switch between an articulation or a different way of playing an instrument. So we have this cello here in contact, which is probably one of the world's most popular samplers. There's other great samplers out there like Falcon and Hallion made by Steinberg. In contact, we're gonna go find a string instrument. So I'm gonna go sound type, bowed strings, and then here we've got a couple of instruments we can choose from. Now it thins it down, let's go to the cello. So we've got recordings of an actual cello. Sounds amazing. And if I play hard, it slides from one note to the next. And then we have different ways of playing. So we have detaché. Staccato. And pizzicato. We can also go and add more articulations to this cello by clicking these little dots. And here we could add something like spiccatissimo, so really, really short. These key switches now are down on these lower keys, so I can see these red keys down at the bottom. And on this Complete Control Mark III keyboard, uh, I've got videos on it. It's fantastic for this kind of stuff because it shows you on the keyboard uh, where these key switches are and then you've got some controls on the screen. So I'm using the lower keys to say, all right, let's switch between long notes, short notes, or that trill. So that's using key switches. And again, just adds so much believability to a fake instrument, something that we're trying to fake with the computer, because that's what these virtual instruments really are trying to do, right? So that's sampled orchestral instruments, and then samples go way beyond that. Of course, we can have just little recordings of, say, a drum loop. Here on this track, I'm using a program called Battery, and in Battery, it's gonna be all just little recordings of sound. So we've got kick, snare, hi-hats, and I'm just using this machine as a controller. I could do everything from the keyboard. So let's just try playing a beat with this now. So I'm gonna use these pads just to control the virtual instrument. <laughs> 
that whole sample based thing is something I love doing as well. Even though I play piano, I love using piano samples and sometimes making my own. But that's sample based virtual instrument still. So this battery thing here is just triggering back samples. Now just imagine any instrument in the world recreated and captured and then triggered back by a sampler. The other thing we've got, of course, is hybrid instruments like Omnisphere, where you've got a combination of samples and synthesis. So what they'll do in Omnisphere is they'll give you four different layers, and on each layer you can either have a synthesizer or you can have a sample. So I can go and choose any sample. I can bring my own samples in or I can use the tens of thousands of samples that they have in this program, and you can have them all trigger at the same time. So that's a sample and synthesis kind of instrument. And we have other virtual instruments like pigments that also do this. So if I click on pigments, you can see that you can have uh, an engine one and an engine two. And on this one, we could have like a wavetable or an analog synthesizer, just like the old hardware. And then on engine two, we can have a sample. And you're hearing both of them at the same time. So let's go through a couple patches and see if we can find something. There we go. And uh, if you look at this one here, we've got an analog synthesizer on as engine one. And so if I turn off engine two, we're here going to hear just that one. And then on engine two, we've got a sample. Whatever the sample is, so. But I could bring in my own sample and drop it right in there and have it play back the sound of my voice or something. I could say a word. And then it would map that out all over the keyboard. It's very cool stuff. And you can change where the sample starts and all of that kind of thing. So these are these hybrid instruments that are combinations of sample and synthesis engines. Another thing I should quickly mention is browsers. If you're new to virtual instruments, you're going to have to get your brain around these different browsers. So if I go to something like Omnisphere, it's got this folder right in the middle. You click on that, and then on the left-hand side, you're going to see categories of sounds. So pads and strings are what uh, Omnisphere does really well. It was kind of started as a pads-only instrument. So these long, sustaining sounds. We've got synth mono. One of my favorites is this uh, authentic triangle. This one's been around forever. If I want to, I can get very specific with this browser and say, I want a synth mono sound. I want it to be hollow and pure. You've got aggressive up at the top. So you can really quickly find patches, we call them patches, over on the right hand side that correspond with something that you are imagining. Another example of a browser would be in contact. If you click on the library here, you're going to be met with all of this kind of metadata up top. If I reset my little library, you can see I can go by brand and all sorts of different companies can make libraries for contact. That's what's kind of a weird concept as well, because this is this is now like third party running inside third party inside a program. It's very inception, isn't it? I've got all these different libraries here, like damage is all about big percussion, cine winds, cine brass, cine strings all made by CineSamples, a totally different company running inside contact. Then I've got sound type, so I can say, all right, let's reset that and just go, I want to find a flute. I want to find an actual flute. So you click on flute and only the libraries that have flute sounds in it show up, which is great. So now I can go in here and find some flute samples that sound good. So CineWinds Core would be a great place for me to go look for some flutes. And then over on the right hand side, you're going to find the patches. So you go click on the right, you get a little preview double click and then it loads the patch for you. If I go to something like Softube's new Model 77, you click this little window right here and then again you're going to get some kind of metadata. I want something brassy, so now only the brassy patches show up. This is how most browsers work for virtual instruments. So once you get your brain around one, it's usually pretty easy to find other patches as well in other programs. If I go over to the OPXAV, they've got this little library symbol. Click on that and then I can say, all right, let's go to types and I want a sub bass patch. And now only the sub bass patches show up. Double click and keep playing through until you find one you like. So last thing I'll say is just about controlling your virtual instruments. Because it's very easy to get sort of lured into my videos and a whole bunch of other people's videos that show off these fancy shiny keyboards. They're wonderful. Here's another keyboard I'll show you in a second. But the truth is 
If you're starting out with this stuff, what you might need is just an old keyboard that's hiding in your aunt's basement. So make sure you do check if somebody around you has a keyboard that has MIDI output. So this is what MIDI output looks like. Just five pin cable. And all I've got here is a very simple MIDI interface. And this just connects to the computer through USB. So this is an M Audio MIDI interface, hooks up to the computer. And then now I can use this MIDI cable to plug into an old keyboard, maybe from the 80s, and use that to control any of my virtual instruments. So you really don't need the fancy stuff with all the sliders and knobs. But if you find yourself wishing you had hardware control over these kinds of faders and stuff, you can then start looking for those kinds of keyboards. So lately I've been doing a lot of reviews for Arturia and Arturia has these keyboards that have beautiful sliders and knobs and the higher end versions will have you know, fancier screens on them. The lower end ones will have cheaper quality keys. Some of them have pads that you can actually trigger just like I've been triggering this machine here. Some of them don't. The complete control keyboard here has all these lights which show you things like the key switch and then they have a beautiful display which show you patch information if you're on contact patches or using their complete control software. So it's not just their software that'll show up on the screen but any company that's actually made their virtual instruments able to be shown on the complete control keyboards. But the other thing you can do if you're really lucky is keep checking Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or whatever, whatever you use and find yourself a guitar. So I'm controlling our virtual cello with this old Yamaha SHS-10. Found it on Facebook Marketplace. One of these days I'll relive my, my 80s dreams and uh, make, a, make an 80s pop hit. Start playing live with the, the guitar, if you're lucky. So let's go to my Omnisphere patch. kind of stuff with this thing but it's got onboard sounds too and, and you think these virtual instruments sound great just wait till you hear this that is 24 that is a uh, bass sure uh what else we got uh voice let's go to a, tw a cello why not cello 21 whoops Who needs a virtual cello when you've got these kind of sounds? And not only that, it's got a demo song, which I'll probably get copyright issues if I play too much of. Give you my heart. But it is pretty fun that you can go find vintage keyboards with MIDI output and then hook them up to your computer and control modern virtual instruments with it. It's, uh, it's kind of fun. Anyways, 80s pop hit coming up soon to uh, Jeff Gibbons channel near you. One more controller I should probably show you is this Osmos. I have videos on it. And in this case, I'm actually controlling their virtual instrument called Noisy, or Noisy 2 is the newest version. And they've just given us even more ability to control virtual instruments with this hardware because it does have its own sounds built in. So as you can see, I can bend pitch side to side which is something that we haven't really ever been able to do other than on something like the Rolly. Not only can you wiggle keys for pitch, but you can press down and get this extra, these two extra stages called poly pressure and aftertouch. And if I push down, it keeps sending information. And if I push even further, it sends another type of information. And you can actually see it on Noisy 2, this virtual instrument of theirs the two different phases. So there's the top phase, and then there's the bottom phase. And then you can use patches that have multiple notes and play very softly 
amount of expression out of their keyboard. It's just literally one of my favorite things I've ever had in my studio. But this takes the price range up into another level, definitely. So that is something to be aware of. But just gives you an idea of where MIDI has gone, where we are at now, and what's coming. It's very exciting times for sure. So I hope this helps you understand a little bit more about virtual instruments. Let me know in the comments things that you don't understand, things that you want to see more videos on. And if you're new here, of course, hit that subscribe button and the bell, and I'll see you in the next video.